Okay. Um, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Yep. Um, I can hear Eduardo you just, fine. Eduardo just confirmed the other group can hear us. Yes, also they can hear us now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Kelvin Mulungu. Um, I work as an agricultural economist with CIMIT in Zambia. I'm going to moderate uh, this webinar, which is uh, one of the installments uh, in a series of uh, main webinars uh, that have been happening since last year under the ADI project. Um, the ADI project is a, a joint USAID and Department of State uh, development response. And the main goal is to provide crucial support uh, to ensure that millions of smallholder farmers in Malawi, Tanzania, and Zambia uh, have at their fingertips information and innovations that are needed. And these are demand-driven and also market-based approaches that are being used to deliver these uh, innovations. And the goal is to increase food production and also mitigate uh, the impacts of climate change, uh, given the global food and fuel and fertilizer prices uh, that have increased. Um, in this uh, today's webinar is specifically going to focus on some of the responses uh, that have been happening under the project uh, from the different partners, and mostly from um, the presenters are going to present to be from CIMIT. And just briefly, maybe I'm going to run through. Um, how the program is, uh, how the webinar is going to happen. So the presenters are going to present for about 30 minutes. Um, and then there'll be a 20 minute question and answer in which you're allowed to raise your hand. And once you raise your hand, you'll be able to give you the functions to unmute yourself. And then you can talk. Um, and then the questions are going to be answered. And then we're going to wrap up, hoping to just wind up everything within the next uh, one hour or so. Uh, the presenters uh, presenting on Eonino, I think as we might all be aware, there's uh, Eonino this year and it's affected uh, parts globally and Southern and East Africa uh, have been hit. Uh, we've seen floods in East Africa uh, where a lot of people have died, infrastructure has been destroyed. And we've also been, and we've also uh, seen the droughts uh, that have happened in mostly Southern Africa, parts of Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe have been heavily affected by the droughts. That, I, that is the result of the Onino. And actually in Zambia, Zimbabwe and Malawi, because of the results and the consequential uh, food shortage has been declared um, a disaster, a national disaster and an emergence. And these are the countries that ADI works in, uh, some of them, and therefore, the farmers that work with have been heavily affected. And as a project, we needed to devise some mechanisms uh, to help farmers respond to this Onino and also so that they can be prepared uh, for the future. I'm Longoma, as you can see on your screen, who's an agricultural economist uh, based um, in Simit, the Harare, or Zimbabwe, and Majuta Chidua, a cropping systems agronomist based in Simit, Malawi. Uh, are going to present on this, and I'm going to give the floor to them now, take it up. So please, uh, Hambulo and Majita. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Majita, you. Yes, thank you very much, Kevin, um, for that introduction. Um, so just to um, reiterate, we are going to talk today um, about the accelerated data-driven responses to El Nino in Southern Africa. And I just want to start um, by welcoming and appreciating everyone who's here on the call today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on um, where you are today. Um, so we are going to speak to you about um, accelerated data-driven responses, um, work that uh, we have recently published an info note on this, and we wanted um, 
to bring this to you today and to also acknowledge that although Hambulo and myself are speaking to you today, this is really work that has been a result of um, the work of a group of many. Um, so these are colleagues that we've worked with, including, um, as you can see on your screens, Peter Stimela, um, Kelvin Mungulungu, who is the moderator today, Isaiah Nyagumbo, Jonathan Odong, as well as our program director, um, Sieg Snap. Um, so we also want to acknowledge um, um, that this has been funded through the USAID, um, the United States Agency for International Development, as well as the Department of State. Um, so this project is all possible due to funding from these two entities to CIMIT as well as IFDC and the African Development Bank Group. Um, so as you can see on your screens, you have um, standard precipitation index map, which shows a deviation from climatological averages. Um, and this is showing extreme effects um, or extreme deviation. As you see this, um, the map getting really intense red, that's showing larger and um, significant proportions of Southern Africa, as uh, Kelvin has already alluded to, have been affected by this. And as we were going in the field, we did see evidence of this, as you can see those pictures on the front cover of the publication. Um, you can see devastated and wilting um, uh, soybean as well as um, maize crops. And so uh, it was really critical for us to um, have a response for the farmers to this. So the objectives of our meeting today is to share experiences um, on the implementation that we did on data-driven responses to El Nino and this is mostly from Malawi and Zambia, uh, which are two of the countries where ADA is working, and also use this as a platform to invite dialogue on learnings um, from the El Nino season, as well as to um, use this as a platform to contribute to actions for future um, climate events. Um, climate extremes. So in this particular case, we are talking about an El Nino event, uh, but we know that uh, in the previous year, 2022-2023, these same farmers were affected, uh, a lot of these farmers were affected by floods. And so it's essential that um, as a community of practitioners and scientists and implementers, policymakers, we found ready um, to respond to this and to also capacitate the farmers to respond. So just to give a small, very short overview of um, the situation that our farmers, the farmers that we're working with find themselves in, um, smallholder farmers in Southern Africa are in a potentially um, self-perpetuating cycle that is characterized by low productivity and low income cycles. And because of this, um, farmers then are not able to make investments into their agriculture. They are really in a situation where um, potentially this cycle could be going down, spiraling downwards and making them more and more vulnerable. Um, they have poor soils and they've got, uh, they're working on lands that are degrading. And uh, at the same time, these farmers are depending on rain-fed agriculture. Now, in this era of uh, extreme climate variability, uh, we really need to find ways to help these farmers respond. And these need to be um, uh, market-led interventions. And at the same time, we're working with farmers who are exposed to uh, very poor market infrastructure and not a lot of options that they can use um, to respond. So we acknowledge that breaking this vicious cycle needs strategic investments to strengthen market-led innovations and interventions and uh, to work also with strategic value chains because we're working with um, very vulnerable um, farmers. So all of this work, of course, is being done in the auspices of ADI and um, 
knowing that our farmers are extremely vulnerable to uh, shocks um, so that these global uh, price price hikes from fertilizers and food have really badly affected these farmers and um, they're left uh, really exposed. So ADA is a rapid response program uh, meant to ensure that these smallholder farmers have information as well as innovations that they need using market-based approaches to maintain or to improve the food production that they have, that they depend on for their livelihoods, as well as to mitigate, um, so yes, to mitigate the impacts that I've spoken of. The approach that we're using on ADI is rapid scaling of existing innovation. So we're looking for quick wins. We're looking for innovations that we know already work, that when farmers can take up, they can really be um, impactful for them. They can really make a difference for their lives. Um, and we have a target of uh, 3 million farmers reach, and we're using various uh, approaches to uh, get to them um, to the last mile. The outcomes that we're seeking is improving the food security as well as resilience um, of the farming systems and ultimately to improve the farmers' livelihoods. So ADA actually works um, within four thematic areas. And um, these thematic areas are um, seed systems. So because we know, of course, uh, the genetics are very important and a lot of our farmers are not using um, the genetics that are available for them. So the stress tolerant, in this case, drought tolerant varieties are really, really key. But at the same time, we're also thinking about uh, biofortified varieties, also very important. And um, so we're talking about seed systems for both maize and legumes um, that we want to get farmers to get more aware of and to really understand what the value of these are in their farming systems. We're also um, leading work on agricultural advisories, and these are advisories across uh, many areas, the crops, the soils, the weather, um, all the management that the farmers can do, and of course, the selection of um, the genetics as well, that also comes into the advisory. So it's a really broad area. And we try to identify um, areas where farmers um, uh, need the most information. And we also do this with a ba with back feed, which basically means that we try to ensure that we get feedback from the farmers. We get um, also social inclusion. We make sure that all those um, farmer demographics that are not so much represented in many um, um, interventions, we are able to reach all those because we don't want to leave anybody behind. Um, we also have a uh, focus on improved soil health and fertilizer use efficiency, which is led by the IFDC, um, as well as access to finance, which is led by the African uh, Development Bank Group. As I mentioned, um, gender and social inclusion is a cross-cutting theme in this work. Kambulo. Thank you, Mazwita. Uh, riding on the, the protocols Mazwita already mentioned, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hambulo Ngoma, an agriculture economist with CIMIT. Just to take over and continue with our conversations. Now, what you have on the screen is a picture that shows crops at different stages in a normal season on top. You see those health looking legumes and uh, maize crops with farmers meeting, having conversations around the demonstrations or the trials as it were. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom are pictures that we took from the field um, during this current season in parts of Zambia. So just trying to illustrate the scale of the issue that we are talking about today. Now, I'll go a little bit into, into details just to talk about the scale of the El Nino effects. So this is a field um, in Eastern Zambia, in the Southern parts of Eastern of Zambia in Sinda. Imagine you're waking up as a farmer and you've seen your field completely devastated to this extent. This is an actual field that I took a picture of myself so various assessments have been done about the scale of the effects of the El Nino. It's been dubbed as the, the worst 
sort of mid-season droughts or dry spells in the last hundred years um, that has ever been experienced in Southern Africa uh, with prolonged uh, dry spells that have affected leading as Kelvin and mentioned in his introduction to depravation of national disasters in Zambia, Malawi and Zimbabwe. But of course, many more other countries have been affected in the region and probably they will declare national disasters. We don't know, we just a matter of time. So th this is just a snapshot uh, showing at least the countries that have declared a state of national, national disaster. Estimates from the, the UN agencies and other players indicate that about 19 million people are affected and the required response is of the order of about $2.2 billion to sort of like avert the, the crisis in the region. So this is a massive crisis that we're talking about. So here today we're talking about uh, data-driven responses. What do we mean by data-driven responses? Basically, there are three key components. The first part includes some aspects of assessment for you to get an understanding of the base situation. And then that guides you to decide on interventions in order to address the situation. So that includes some analysis of, of some sorts. And then that guides now your, your actions in terms of the actual interventions that you're going to, to take. And I'm going to go through a little bit of these um, as we go on. So in the context of ADI, there are basically four main broad areas of interventions. Um, the first one, of course, is around assessment, where we conducted some household surveys to get an understanding of what farmers know about El Nino, how prepared they were, in order for us to identify what ADI could do to support those farmers. We, armed with this information from the farmers themselves, we then uh, designed some advisory campaigns uh, using two platforms that I'm going to, we're going to talk about in this webinar as we go along. And these campaigns were specifically uh, targeted at El Nino, so providing El Nino advisories to farmers. The third component is on rapid deployment of uh, stress tolerant varieties or drought tolerant varieties in this particular case. As Mazuita mentioned, this is one of the core, the core pillars of the ADI project. The last but not least is promotion of improved agronomic practices, because we all well understand that it goes beyond seed to improve productivity in uh, smallholder farming systems. So a bit of details about, about the survey. Um, so we did a survey with about 1,100 farmers in Malawi, central Malawi, and in parts of Eastern, Central, and Southern Zambia. And basically the objective was to assess farm awareness and get to understand their preparedness to respond to, to the El Nino phenomena. Um, just give me a second. I need to make sure. Okay. Um, so what did we find from the survey? A little over, a little under half, about 40, 2% were aware of the impending El Nino, both in Malawi and Zambia. And remember, this is a survey based on about 500 and 600 households, 599 in Malawi, 501 in Zambia. About 42% 40, on average were aware. In terms of the sources of information, the majority of the farmers got this information through radio or TV, public extension, but also through farmer to farmer exchanges. Again, this sort of like highlights the importance of these channels as a means of delivering information. So as we come in as development practitioners or researchers, we need to think about how we, 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 we pick back on these and strengthen them. In terms of the anticipated effects, the majority uh, expected reduced rainfall, droughts, fewer rain days, and prolonged dry spells. Uh, in terms of the anticipated uh, effects directly, a lot of the farmers we talked, we talked to anticipated reduced crop output, in some instances, total crop failure. And in some instances, again, about 20%, a little less, less than 20% expected an increase in the outbreak of pests and diseases. And we saw that with rosette um, groundnut disease this year. It's been quite unprecedented. So it seems to thrive uh, when the conditions are drier. 
Um, in terms of the planned responses, most of the farmers that we interviewed were planning on planting early maturing varieties, drought tolerant varieties, and on implementing some climate smart agriculture. And this sort of like dovetails very well with some of the activities that we are doing in, in, in ADI. So this information was critical in order to guide what we do next. So I think at this juncture, I'm going to turn it back to Mazuta to talk to us about the El Nino advisories that were organized um, and implemented on ADI. Over to you, Mazuta, please. Thank you. You are muted. Mazuta, you are muted. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, so ADI partnered with Excellence in Agronomy on the Grow Smart campaign. Um, and the Excellence in Agronomy is um, a 1CGIAR initiative. So here we are leveraging investments into the CGIAR um, to develop and deploy agronomy solutions at scale, which is what excellence in agronomy is um, basically dedicated to. Um, this was a very appropriate partnership uh, to scale innovations because while ADI is looking for those quick wins, um, uh, excellence in agronomy is also working to uh, develop solutions that can be deployed at scale. Um, so following this, we this partnership, we prioritized messages that we could broadcast using the interactive voice response platforms across both Malawi and Zambia, where the EIA and ADI intercept with um, team members working on both um, initiatives. Um, so... Um, the messages that we focused on, on excellence in agronomy, or sorry, on the ADI advisory campaigns were eight. And the first message was really um, more of a definition uh, so that farmers actually get an, a better awareness and real understanding. Because while this is a natural um, and irregular uh, phenomenon, it is periodic and farmers need to know that so that in future they can anticipate and when they anticipate, they can be prepared for it. Um, so there was a definition first and then there's advisories on how to get the right varieties. Um, so this is to do with getting the genetics that can help farmers do the best that they can, um, the best, uh, the list um, to be affected varieties, but also uh, types of crops. So it's not just the varieties, but also um, uh, the crops that they are to choose. Then soil moisture management, of course, very critical to ensure that the little moisture that is uh, received is used to the best um, um, to the best use to get the most value out of this um, soil moisture management. Um, so we had a total of eight messages, key messages, and you can see the broad topics um, on your screens, uh, managing soil fertility, use of inoculants, which basically improves the robustness of the crops and reduces their own vulnerability to dry conditions, uh, spreading the risk by diversification of the crops portfolio, as well as a livestock portfolio, uh, timely planting and making sure that farmers are planting when they have sufficient moisture, uh, as well as managing other diseases, um, Managing these diseases means that you improve um, the, the, the resilience of these crops when they are more, um, they're healthier. Um, so this was all done in a process where after we finished this prioritization, we translated these messages into local languages. Um, so this was one main language in Malawi, which is Chichewa. Um, but in Zambia, we were actually working with a much uh, wider range of uh, languages. I think this would be nine that we translated to in Zambia. And then we did a pre-testing and refinement before we launched um, these campaigns. 
So on your screen now, you can see uh, the listener statistics. So we can see that we've reached out to as many as 586,000 unique listeners. Um, as of today, this has come off the dashboard of the campaign today. So 586,000 listeners. And these listeners are split um, about 60-40 um, between males and females. Um, and they are located in different parts of the country, but we can see we did get good reach into those uh, areas like southern Zambia, as well as parts of southern Malawi as well, that were most affected by the El Nino in the two countries. We also saw that there were some uh, messages that were more popular than others, and it's good to see that the definition of El Nino was actually one of those most popular ones, because um, probably farmers did not understand well, you know, you, you start to hear a lot of El Nino talk on the radio, on TV, on WhatsApp, but without understanding what it is. So that was one of the most um, popular messages. And um, yeah, so you can see how popular they were on your screens there. Um, and in terms of uh, next steps, we are going to implement um, a targeted 15 question a survey, both in fact, we are currently implementing um, 15, a 15 questionnaire, um, 15 question survey, both in Malawi and Zambia. And the survey focus is on El Nino. So access to information about the El Nino, capacity of farmers to respond because having the information does not necessarily translate to capacity to respond, um, accessibility and effectiveness of the adaptation measures that are available for the farmers. And in addition to this, we would also um, implement um, some focus group discussions where we can uh, get more qualitative information about the success stories to really understand uh, what characterizes these successes more deeply so that um, as we plan for, uh, we can be sure there'll be another El Nino um, within the next decade um, so that we can have uh, better responses um, for this. I will turn you over back to Hambulo, who will conclude. Thank you, Mazwita. So just continuing with our conversation, I think so far we've talked about um, on the action side of things, we've talked about our um, advisory campaigns. Now I want to bring it down now to the drought tolerant varieties and the improved agronomic practices. So just let me go back one slide. So in this particular respect, um, ADI is working with 13, 33 private sector companies, most of them seed companies, 15 NGOs, seven public public entities, the NAS, and um, a total of about six CGIR centers uh, doing various things. So you remember from my area, my area presentation that uh, most farmers talked to said they, would, they were thinking about planting early maturing varieties, drought tolerant varieties as a way of responding to the El Nino. So ahead of the El Nino season, 2023-2024, ADI was very active on the demand creation side of things for improved genetics, improved varieties. And we have a concept we call mega demonstrations, which are like 1600 square meter learning centers, demonstrations that uh, include multiple crops and multiple varieties per crop. So we set up quite a big, uh, about 125 uh, of those across the ADI countries. And also just to mention that ADI now has some activities in, uh, in Katanga region of DRC. And this was complemented by over 6,000 roadside demonstrations and over 2,500 field days, including virtual field days, by the way, which was quite some good innovation that was adapted by ADI from other sister projects, and also some seed fairs. On the legume side of things, um, 17 varieties for different legumes were being promoted. And as we know, most of these legumes have uh, better tolerance to to, to water stress compared to um, some of the cereals like, like maize. And in terms of seed production, we're looking at some um, quantities of about 200 and 900 metric tons of foundation and certified seed, 
produced by partners on ADI. This, this was ahead of the, the current season. On the maize side of things, about 41 st restaurant maize varieties or maize hybrids in particular were being promoted. Um, and about 42 metric tons of early generation seed produced and over 13,000 metric tons of, uh, of certified seed. Um, again, continuing with um, preparations for the El Nino season, most of our seed, seed companies partners said they sold a lot of the early maturing and drought tolerant maize varieties as farmers were anticipating the El Nino and reported very high sales of such varieties. ADI is also working with different partners, including the International Water Management Institute, IMI, in Zambia, and the Total Land Care in Zambia as well, in particular, to support some irrigation efforts. Um, so the 2023-2024 season is an union season, of course, but also it provides a very good test ground for which farmers now have the opportunity to witness the performance of the different technologies. Uh, my colleague Mazwita, the agronomist, was just reminding me about how this is a perfect test for G by M. And these things will be documented, genetics and management. Of course, we have several, several ongoing learning activities on the demand creation side of things. For example, Kelvin, the moderator today, and some of us are involved in some randomized control trials in trying to understand the effectiveness of demos as a means of creating demand and creating awareness and also around demo densities. There's some work going on around um, effectiveness of digital advisory services and whether the recipient of the message matters. Uh, there's lots of work going on around trying to estimate demand for the different um, improved varieties, in particular focusing on four annual tolerant maize varieties, rasp soybean varieties, and rosette tolerant uh, groundnut varieties. And this is done using different approaches, including experimental options. There's lots of work learning happening around yield gaps and trying to assess the effectiveness of the different technologies and the extent to which they can help to reduce uh, the persistent yield gaps in the region. So to conclude, in case you want to to, to keep one or two things from what Mazuita and I have talked about. We have three points from our activities around data-driven responses to El Nino. The first one is that um, early planning is critical so that farmers are given a fighting chance to deal with climate extremes. As Mazuita mentioned, this time it's El Nino, next time it might be something else. The second point is that uh, Data-driven responses to climate extremes are crucial to design demand-driven interventions and market-led interventions. And this ultimately can help to improve targeting. You don't want to promote drought-tolerant maize varieties in a high rainfall area when the Nino is, is, is likely to have a larger effect in a, in a, in a drought-prone area, for example. And the third point is, um, there's need to use multiple channels for advisories. On ADI, as we've just talked about today, we're just talking about the IVR platform, which doesn't require a smartphone, but just a feature phone. But we have other activities that are based on radio and TV. You saw in my area present in my area slides that that was a very important channel um, as a source of information for farmers. We have animated videos, we have farmer field school type of extension approaches. So a multiplicity of these advisory channels is, is the way to go. So those are the three key takeaway messages. Thank you very much. I think we'll stop here and turn it back to Kelvin for any for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Kambulo and Majuita. Uh, this was a good presentation. Uh, we have uh, briefly followed through uh, from um, explaining about the magnitude of El Nino, what kind of a devastation it has caused, um, to looking at if farmers are aware about El Nino, uh, what proportion of farmers are aware, and uh, also what response has been taken in terms of advisories, uh, and also from the agronomic side in terms of promoting drought and varieties or varieties that are tolerant to some of the um, other diseases that might have become common because of El Nino, for example, as it in the pictures. Um, 
uh, that we saw. I'm going to open the floor uh, for discussion and for question and answer. Um, those who have questions uh, can raise their hands. Uh, our IT is going to help us uh, to give you the functionality to unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'm going to throw in a few uh, ideas uh, that I'm hoping we can also discuss. Uh, I'll take advantage of my role as a moderator. Uh, I think I will briefly touch on some of the uh, one thing that I briefly wanted to talk about in terms of advisories. How do we ensure that we give the right advisory to the right group? Because I think there's so much variation with the Onino, as you might have seen, for example, in Zambia in the few tours. In the northern region, we're having extreme rainfall, like above normal rainfall. And starting maybe from somewhere mid central, to southern, we have a drought. How do we make sure that we don't tell farmers in the northern to plant early maturing varieties, which might also become a disaster for them, <coughs> excuse me, because of the too much rainfall that they are likely to have? Uh, that's one. Um, and also to the other remaining uh, 42 minus 100 or 100 minus 42 that are not aware. Um, what do we do about that group that hasn't prepared for Nino? And lastly, in terms of action, um, I think one of the problems that has been noted in uh, early warning systems is that early warning doesn't lead to early action, unfortunately. <laughs> even at uh, government level or at police level, stakeholders and even partners. And we might have seen some of these things in the field. For example, farmers were still planting, even for some you know, organizations, they're still having Pana 53 and all those other varieties that um, might not be drought tolerant. So the link between early warning and early action. Um, I am now going to let other people come in with questions, but you can consider these as we discuss later on. Um, Eduardo, you can help me when you see a hand, please. Okay, sure, Kelvin. Um, thank you, Kelvin. I hope that's better now. Yes, that's can better. You thank you. Yes, we okay, can hear good. You. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. sorry about that. I'm having trouble with my um technology. Um, so I will just start off by um, responding to part of your first question, and then I will give someone else uh, maybe an opportunity to ask a question or to um, uh, come in with more responses. Uh, but when we're talking about how to ensure the right targeting, how do we ensure that the right messages are going to the right people? Um, this is part of what we were saying in, um, in our talk that uh, we need to use, um, we need to do an, an assessment before we go in with our messages, before we go in with any of the actions. And that's part of the whole data-driven approach that we're pushing for. Um, so like you could see from the beginning, there've been models that have been done in the past and these can help us to anticipate parts of the country, parts of different countries that will have, um, that will be most, uh, that will be worst affected. And so when we know that these parts are going to be worst affected, then um, we, we, we provide the appropriate advisories in those areas. And if we work together well, even the policy environment can help us to ensure, for example, that in those southern regions of Zambia where um, farmers are not using irrigation and yet they are most they're going to be worst affected by the El Nino. We ensure that the only varieties that are going there or most varieties that are going there are the drought tolerant varieties. And so even that 42% or that 58% that doesn't know about the El Nino is only going to have access to genetics that is appropriate for them. So in terms of the material that is going to them, we can actually use some of those institutional approaches to make sure that what is available is what the farmer needs. Um, Hambulo, would you Thank like you. to um, Do we have a question? Hambulo, do you want to say something? 
Sorry, go ahead. Now I was wondering if there's a question, then I can come to your, I see some hands. Maybe let's take those, then I'll, I'll come to your, yes. to, your, to your questions as well. So James, go ahead, please. I have two questions, one for Mazwita and the, the other one for Hambulu. The first one is the, the platform that you are using to dispatch or to deliver El Nino awareness messages. Uh, I have been here like 17 years, but we are, we are, we are always having difficulties to, to have a radio connection, even internet. So what are you using? What method are you using so that the, these remote areas can receive their awareness messages in time, as well as the, uh, for them to prepare well for the coming season? And the, the other one is for Hambulo. It's about the drought tolerance, mainly yeah. for uh, legumes. You have said uh, there's, I think, 20 or, 20 or, or 900 metric tons in foundation. Or uh, statistics have shown that uh, in Malawi we are we, we are like using uh, legume varieties that were developed at least 10, 15 years ago, and there is uh, I can say variety pollution. So, what measures are you using for to upscale these uh, new varieties as well as the use and adoption? To farmers so that they can use these varieties as the tomorrow or as this coming season. Thank you. Um, thank you, James, uh, for your questions. Um, I will respond to the first question and then allow Hambulo to respond to the second one. So you were asking about um, El Nino awareness messages, the platforms we're using. I will assume that you are in Malawi, as you said something about um, in Malawi. And um, so the IVR platform that we were talking about on this talk, the um, interactive voice response messages platform is a mobile based platform that uses simple feature phones. So you don't even need the internet. So if you're in a place where you can make a phone call from a simple feature phone, it doesn't need to be a smartphone, then you can be able to access these messages. Um, if you're in Malawi, um, unfortunately you need to be using Airtel. If you're in Malawi, you can dial uh, three, two, one, press hash, and then you will have um, uh, you will be transferred to a variety of campaigns and then you will choose the El Nino campaign to get information about the El Nino campaign. And if you're in Zambia, for those calling in or listening from Zambia, then you use the 667 platform. Uh, so it's 667 hash, similar to the 321 in Malawi, and the, um, it's the same. In Zambia, you would need to select the, the, the language that you need to, to listen in. And in Malawi, that's English and Chichewa. And in Zambia, you have a wider variety of um, uh, languages. And in terms of the alternative platforms, so ADA is actually using a multiple uh, multiplicity of um, platforms. So we are also on radio. Several of our partners are using um, Zodiac and we are also um, on TV. We are also in fields, like in very many different districts in the Southern and the Central districts. Uh, we are in the field physically with different partners bringing these messages to the farmers. Um, so depending on where you are, you are most likely, you are, you're quite likely near to some activity that is going on with ADI. Um, yeah, maybe you could tell us more about where you are and we can actually give you more direction. Thank you, Mazwita. Um, thank you, James, for... I have some feedback. Is that from my end? Okay, thank you, James, for that great question. Um, of course, the legume seed system is not as developed as the maize seed system. And that is part of the reason why ADI is intervening in the legume seed systems as well, to try and uh, strengthen that. How we do that is by making interventions both on the demand side and on the supply side. 
So on the demand side, the focus is on creating demand, raising awareness for the improved varieties that we're talking about. But then, so imagine you raise this demand among farmers, right? You raise the demand, farmers are aware, the appetite is high, and they want to buy these varieties. But if those varieties are not available on the market, or farmers don't know where to get those varieties, then your job is just half done. And that is the reason why ADI also intervenes on the supply side of things. So working with seed companies to help them build up their capacities to produce, to market these improved varieties while adhering and making sure that the quality of the varieties and the seeds that go out meets the required national standards. So we have those interventions on both sides. On the demand side, it's a lot of uh, demonstrations, seed fairs, um, and a lot of other related advisories that we're talking about. A big question that remains though is around the effectiveness of these different methods. And that's where now the learning component of ADI comes in to try and help iron out some of these issues. I just wanted to quickly comment on Kelvin, Kelvin's comments. I mean, these are fundamental comments, Kelvin. Um, how do we ensure that the advisories are sent to the right targets or the right recipients? That's a big question. Um, I think in addition to what Mazuita said, we also need to pick back on the on the policy on the policies in the different countries where we're operating. I'll give an example of uh, input sub subsidy programs in most countries in Southern Africa. We need to have an effort to try and ensure that those programs, first of all, do deliver the appropriate crop varieties for the different regions. I think that would be one big starting point. We're doing a little bit of that on ADI in Zambia, but if we manage to do that, I think that would be that would be a plus. The other thing is getting these localized advisories is a costly venture. So if you have these IVR campaigns, the ones, for example, we have now with Viamo, is there a way of getting these localized to particular places only? and blocked off from the rest of the country, targeted advisories through IVR. That now takes us into another realm of uh, technology that probably we need to discuss with our tech partners. Um, any warning does not always lead to any action. That's very true. But then how do we bridge that gap? You know, farmers face a myriad of challenges. Part of it is access to finance. Part of it is limited knowledge. So how do we bridge those precursors in order to enable them to take action when something like this happens? I think let me stop there and maybe give chance to others uh, to come in. I see some some comments in the chat as well. Over to you, Kelvin. Thank you. Thank you, Hambulo. Um, thank you. Uh, I think someone, uh, Florence, responded, I believe, to Jen's question. Uh, Florence, I don't think James is able to see your response uh, because I think this is indicated to just us. If you don't mind, kindly raise your hand and you can just make a comment. But if there are any other questions, please raise your hands. You can, Florence, you can unmute yourself and make the contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, I just wanted to like to clarify on James's uh, question, like here in Malawi, most of the varieties that farmers are using, they are listed ones. Like he was uh, referring to say, most of the varieties that are farmers are using, they are like they were listed 15 years ago. So I'm sure the project is utilizing the varieties that 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 were newly released, because like the varieties that were released say 15 years ago. They are not performing like well as as we as you know they were released in a like completely new like the environment is wasn't like this the the one that we're experiencing now due to the climate change and the like. So these varieties, I think they I'm just encouraging the project if we, if we, this is the situation that like you're using these these old varieties, I think it would be good like to. To, to venture into the new released varieties that does is, is promoting, like for legumes, especially so we have been in the groundnuts, we also have some pigeon pea that are new and they are adaptable to the new, like the climate change issues. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Florence. Just... Uh, yeah. Can I want we, can to I sorry. support Florence? <laughs> yes, please. Short. Yeah, let me just just to clarify that um, on ADI we are focusing on recently released varieties that are less than ten years old. So that's the primary focus. Those are the only varieties that um, are supported on ADI, both in terms of seed production, in demand creation, and all the activities that we do. So thank you, Florence, for, for making that point. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you. Uh, is there another hand? Uh, Florence, is this a new hand? Uh, I would is, is there another hand? Edward, are you able to see another hand, please? Another question, clarification, before I come back uh, to Florence, if she wants to speak again. Okay, Florence, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I, I'm not sure this is a new hand or this is an odd hand. Okay, I guess it's an, it's an odd hand. I am not seeing any more questions from my end. Okay. If there are no more questions, I, I still have about seven minutes. I can give uh, Humble and Majorita if they have any uh, last words, and then I can close. Majorita, you want me to go first? Um, thanks, Kelvin. Um, I'm kind of, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Am I okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can, I can go first. I just wanted to, you know, uh, reiterate the the importance of um, data driven approaches to responding to El Nino, and first really uh, to reiterate as well the importance of uh, responding to El Nino at all. Um, when we talk about the El Nino as um, scientists and you know, uh, also on the same side with policymakers and other development practitioners. Um, I think we really are speaking from a position of a lot of privilege because we are able to talk about things in hindsight and talk about how farmers could have done better um, in, in different um, conditions if they had selected, if they had made a different choice or variety of, uh, of crop and everything. But it's really critical for us to act because um, smallholder farmers have such a small window of opportunity to act. Um, if farmers do not act in the right time, they only have in this part of um, Southern Africa, they only have one uh, agricultural season per year. And so if they miss that one, it means then that these farmers don't have um, a livelihood. So even when we're talking about uh, losses per country uh, in terms of yield gap per country, it may look like, um, of course, 22%, which has been the average in the last um, seven El Ninos in, in Malawi. Um, so it may look like, um, yes, it's really bad, but for their smallholder farmers for whom um, the loss is at 80%. And so it's really important for us to close this gap. And it's really important for us to take time to um, think about how we can utilize the opportunities that we have. And also keeping in mind that some of our innovations have a long incubation period. And so we need to find ways to improve on adoption. And this is really just a call to all um, agricultural researchers in the community to say, we need to think really about how can we improve our responsiveness so that our farmers can be uh, more resilient um, to El Nino and other um, climate hazards. Um, and thank you again for joining this call today. Thank you, Mazwita. Um, just some few remarks from my end um, as we wind up the webinar. I think one of the things 
Yeah, as Mazuita mentioned, data driven is very important. We need evidence based policies, uh, not policy based evidence, as I like to say. But beyond that, how do you then actualize these things on the ground? So partnerships become very important, public private partnerships, because as projects, we have a limited window over which we can be in existence and do our activities with the funding mandates that we have. But if we create partnerships with the private sector, partnerships with the public entities, then the activities that are initiated or carried on by the projects are sure to be carried on in perpetuity. So that is very, very important. So even as we're thinking about our response strategies, for example, to climate extremes, to climate-induced extremes like El Nino, let's think critically about how we can ensure that our interventions are sustainable and partnerships Partnerships are very key in that regard. The second part, specifically to ad advisories. I mean, there's a gazillion of apps, for example, out there, all trying to advise farmers on some aspect of their agricultural activities. To the extent that in some instances, farmers are getting confused. At minimum, as development and agricultural practitioners, we need to ensure that whatever advisories we're trying to put out, uh, number one, approved by the governments in those countries where we are trying to, to disseminate the advisories. This is now a requirement in most countries. On ADI, we make sure that we get those approvals before we put out any information to farmers. Because that is meant to protect the farmers, to ensure that the information that they get has been vetted by agricultural authorities and it has passed, it has been passed to be okay and genuine for the farmers. Second, Going forward, we also need to think about how can we make some of these um, advisory activities sustainable, commercially viable? What is the commercial basis? Lots of advisory campaigns do come on the scene when there's a project, but when the project ends, they end. How can we bring in a commercial aspect to some of these? You know, like what we do on, on our mobile phones. In some instances, if you want to access, if you want to change your ringtone, for example, you have to subscribe to something and pay some few cents, and then you get your ringtone, it will run for some time if you want to change. Can we think about such sustainable kind of advisory uh, campaign modalities for the smallholder farmers? And then the last bit is on the, on the seed system side of things. I think having interventions both on the demand and on the supply side is really critical because it's very frustrating for farmers to have unmet and unfulfilled demand. Farmers are excited about some variety because they've seen it at a demo. They received a small seed pack, they tried it, they thought it was very good, but then that variety is not available on the market. That's one side of the story. On the other side, seed companies should be able to respond. So interventions on both. But even when farmers produce now the grain, so we need interventions on the demand side, on the supply side, and on the market side. Eventually, when they develop the grain, when they, they produce the grain, they should have market linkages for them to, to flood their grain, for them to enjoy their, their, their farming businesses. I think let me end with those two those two points for now. Otherwise, thanks everyone for making time to join us. We hope you can join us again in the next uh, webinar series under ADI. Back over to you, Kelvin, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Hamlo has already done what I was supposed to do. Uh, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you. Uh, you can kindly join us again. The next webinar is going to be on the 30th of May, I believe, and you're going to receive an invitation uh, with the possible uh, topic that will be as well sent through the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.